My name is Jeff Katerba, and I'm originally from Omaha, Nebraska. So I'm the editorial cartoonist for the Omaha World Herald, and um, I've been doing that since, I've been there since 1989. People often ask if I have a, a physical office at the newspaper, do I go into the office? Is it like a nine to five job? So I have a, a daily deadline. I draw a, a new cartoon every day. And when I get up in the morning, I don't know what I'm going to draw that day, mostly. And as long as I, you know, make my deadline by the end of the day, then I've, you know, I've, I've done my job. Uh, and I hopefully I've done it, done it well. And occasionally we'll work elsewhere. We'll, we'll, we'll work remotely. And it's helpful for me to get out of the office. I personally think that Good journalism doesn't just happen at a desk or you know at a, at a at a computer, and it's helpful to be out in the world. And that's where I get a lot of my ideas. In addition to reading, uh, just immersing myself out in you know in the community and in, in the world. I didn't really have anyone directly in my family who was drawing. I had two aunts who uh, were painters, so I was around painters, but not really. You know, there really weren't any cartoonists. I had an uncle who was a journalist, and he was killed about a month after I was born, so I never got to meet him. But I heard all these great stories about how he was a member of the uh, Washington Press Corps and covered uh, John F. Kennedy and uh, covered the space program. So, and then I think just frankly, my father had a day job, but he also repaired televisions. He would buy old TVs, fix them up, and then advertise them in the, in the Sunday newspaper. And he was always worried about his ad, uh, you know, wanted to make sure there weren't any any typos or any errors. So he and I would drive to the newspaper the night before on Saturday night to pick up an early edition of the paper. And I felt, I felt special because I felt like we were time traveling to the next day to get the Sunday paper. So I thought, I'm probably the only kid who has tomorrow's comics tonight. And the newspaper back then was heavy and weighty and it just felt big and thick and important. It felt important. And I just remember, you know, again, um, you know, picking up this, this Sunday paper the night before and if my father allowed me to carry it into the house that it just had this weight to it. In the same way that a stack of typing paper, now it would be, you know, all purpose <laughs> copy paper, but, you know, if I had a ream of typing paper, it felt the same way. Just the thickness of having all that paper, all those blank sheets of paper, which held so much promise, really, because all that blank space meant that I could fill those pages up, uh, you know, with, with my drawings. I don't know if, uh, you know, if I came to cartooning through my love of newspapers or vice versa, but I wouldn't say that politics or current events really played a role in any overt, obvious way. I do remember one of my aunts who was one of the painters. I distinctly remember her watching the Watergate hearings and she was just immersed in the Watergate hearings. And she was reading the Wall Street Journal and talking about how important this was. And I thought it was kind of boring. Now I look back and I think, oh my gosh, I would have loved to have been a cartoonist at that time. I also think my uncle, the journalist, just hearing these stories about him writing columns and, and following the Kennedys, and especially his writing about the space program and my father's interest in the space program as well and getting to stay home to watch the latest Gemini or Apollo launch. So even though that wasn't a political thing, it was definitely a current event kind of thing. And it just felt super important and relevant. I'm convinced if I, I'm convinced that if there was no space program, I don't think I would have been a cartoonist. I think it's that cut and dry. It, it, it not only piqued my imagination as a, as a kid, but I think the, and this, this may sound ridiculous, but I think that it was the, the idea that human beings could travel to the moon and land on the moon, that that, that actually happened, that that, po that that was not just a possibility, that it was a dream, a total fantasy dream, and the science caught up with that dream and that was real and it happened, made me believe as an artist that anything was possible. 
and I've carried that with me. I mean, I, th I think that's like, it's just a, uh, a kind of a guiding principle. Even now when, when I think I get up in the morning and I don't have, I don't know what I'm going to draw that day because I'm drawing a new cartoon every day and I basically have a blank slate, a blank piece of paper every day to, f to fill up. And that's, that's scary as hell. I mean, it just, it's intimidating and fills me, fills me with anxiety. And I go back to that idea that anything is possible. And, and that may sound cornball or something, but um, anything is possible. And if you dream something, if you imagine it, you can put that out into the world. You can, you know, I can essentially land on the moon in my head every day on that page. I look at the moon, I look at a full moon, and especially when it's bright white, it makes me think of blank paper. It reminds me that there, are, there is a ream of blank paper somewhere waiting for me to fill up with, with sketches. I'm not necessarily science-minded. I understand that there are phases of the moon. For me, it's more the poetry of it, the beauty of it, the fact that it's a constant. I mean, there are some nights when you can't see the moon, but it's kind of a constant thing. You know, maybe there's cloud cover, and maybe that's the day that I don't get the best cartoon idea on the page. I don't know, but it's, I'm pretty aware of it. And, and I guess I'd never thought about that before, but it, it, it frequently reminds me of, of drawing. You know, I, I don't know exactly how many space related cartoons I've drawn. It's probably more than the average editorial cartoonist. So even if I'm not commenting specifically on NASA or on the space program, I will often find ways to use space as a backdrop. Not long ago, I did a cartoon on maybe deficits or something like that, and, and I depicted it as a black hole, the U.S. Capitol being sucked into a black hole. There's no university that I know of that teaches editorial cartooning. You can't major in it, get a degree in it. So most editorial cartoonists come to the profession in his or her own way. And, and one of those ways is to look at other cartoonists' work and, and, you know, mimic them or at least study their technique. And that's probably true for most arts. There are people now whose work I admire, but I don't really look at other editorial cartoons now. In fact, I sort of avoid them. But I will look at other art forms, graphic novels and comic books and paintings and sculpture. So looking outside of the profession to maybe be re-energized or look at my own work in a new way. I draw with, start out drawing pencil sketches and then I redraw that cartoon in pencil on a sheet of Bristol board and I use pen and ink, I use brushes and I hand paint everything with watercolor. Most cartoonists I think are using some form of software to either color the cartoons in. Some people are drawing doing you know, the entire cartoon in digital form. I'm not opposed to it. I just prefer that tactile experience of, of uh, you know, hand on, on paper. I like getting ink on my fingers. So the, you know, the technique for me hasn't changed, but what has changed is how timely a cartoon needs to be. And I think that a lot of that has to do with the internet. For example, I'm, I'm syndicated uh, with King Features to 400 other newspapers. And there was a time when you were syndicated, where you would draw your cartoon, you would make a photocopy, you would send it to the syndicate, they would make photocopies, they would then mail, snail mail those back to the newspapers, the newspaper would then reprint that cartoon in the next day's paper, and that might have taken five, six, seven, eight days maybe, maybe longer. So the news cycle being what it is now with 24-hour news and you know, in the internet, of course, that's all changed. And I just feel this so much pressure to be timely, to not just comment on what's happening. Yesterday's news is almost too old. And, and, and it's unfortunate because there are significant things happening, happening that I feel like I can't comment on because by the time it appears in the paper the following day, it's already stale. And so I feel like I'm always trying to uh, be a fortune teller and see the future. What's the big story going to be tomorrow? Can I possibly comment on something that hasn't <laughs> either happened yet or is happening right now? And do I have the time in my brain to really process how I feel about it and what the, the meaning of that issue is? And I think there's a danger there in this fast-paced, you know, media world we live in because I think there's not enough time to reflect and to be thoughtful. So I have to remind myself of that and slow down and uh, just 
take a, you know, take a few breaths and uh, remind myself that I don't have to always draw about what's going to be the big story of the day tomorrow. I can draw what I think is important, but sort of a balance. I would say by the criticism I get is, is almost equal from the left and right. This has absolutely happened on a couple occasions where I've received either emails or phone calls literally on the same day, sometimes within minutes, where someone is saying, you are part of the liberal media. You're part of what's wrong with the media. You're a leftist. And then not long after, you right-wing fascist, blah, blah, blah. I probably consider myself more of an editorial cartoonist than a political cartoonist. I mean, th those terms are sort of interchangeable. Um, certainly, I draw political cartoons as part of my job. I also, you know, also do cartoons about the weather and just uh, you know, social media and technology and uh, cultural events. But politically, I'm a registered independent, and I like to say that I'm a passionate centrist. Uh, I think there are some issues where I'm definitely definitely to the right on, and there are some things that I'm uh, on the left on. Uh, but I love operating from the middle. I think the middle is sexy. I think that the middle gets a bad name, and especially in this world of, of right versus left and red versus blue, I'm sick of it. And I think a lot of other people are, and the truth often is somewhere in between, or there is often a third or fourth way of looking at a particular issue. I just can't operate from one side or the other. So, uh, and it, but it's not that I can't make up my mind. I feel very, very strongly about where I'm at, sort of in the middle, but able to, it gives me the freedom to criticize kind of anybody, really. I, I don't know, my sense is that, you know, the, the average person, if they're paying any attention, that most people are reasonable and most people can understand that there are complexities to any issue and that it's not always this way or that way. It's not always black and white. Just today, uh, a woman had written in and she said she was speaking for thousands of Catholics. She was upset about a cartoon I'd drawn and um, I called her and we talked about it. She was 92 years old and was surprised that I called her. I think a lot of people are often surprised when someone from the media responds to them. And, and uh, a lot of times, um, even if they were initially really angry, they, they will calm down just because someone gave them the time to, to listen to them. But then there are total jerks out there who, you know, want to call you names no matter what. Thank you.